So it's a real pleasure uh, for me today to introduce to you today's Steenbach lecture, Huda Zugby, who um, I thought I would give a couple of minutes of introduction for Huda. Um, she comes as an immigrant to the US and was one of our star immigrants. I like to uh, point that out. She came from Lebanon. Um, and she, in Lebanon, she started her um, medical school there and then kind of halfway through her first year of medical school, the Civil War broke out, and that was not good. Um, she came to the US to finish medical school, then went to Baylor, and the rest is history. She's been a professor at Baylor uh, for, I, well, I don't know, so a long time. <laughs> um, not as long as I've been here, though. Um, she is uh, a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the founding director of the Jan and Dan Duncan Neurological Research Institute at the Texas Children's Hospital. So she's got lots of hats that she wears. Um, I think one of the things that's quite amazing about her over her career is how she's an, um, an MD who has focused on trying to understand disease and the molecular basis of that disease and managed to go from phenotype all the way into molecular mechanism and basic science in a beautiful way. So she really spans that breadth of basic science um, to disease. And I think it's particularly suitable that she is here as the Steenbach lecturer because um, Harry Steenbach was somebody who did something rather similar. This is a picture of, of Harry Steenbach who uh, was born in 1886, he's a little older. Uh, he got his undergrad degree in 1908 at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He then stayed here for graduate school and he was, I think, an, got started as assistant professor in 1916 and then graduated through the ranks by 1920. He was a full professor, so things were a little different in those days. Uh, and his claim to fame, which is a, a rather big one, is that he also spanned the basic science biochemistry to disease. And he discovered that UV irradiation of food generates vitamin D. And very importantly, he patented that, which is why we can have these lectures today. He not only patented it, but he, and he spent $300 of his own money to do that because the university wasn't willing to do it. And then when Quaker Oats wanted to buy his patent, he decided that it was smarter if he got a consortium together and started a licensing company at the UW, which is now Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, or WARF. And he got nine of his friends together, he and eight other friends, they each put in $100, so Worf started with a $900 in, you know, initial budget, and it's clearly grown since then. But the patents have been really important for Wisconsin, and again, he's done exactly what you've done, except, you know, in his own era, which is going from the very sort of disease-oriented rickets, he basically solved rickets, to um, uh, the molecular basis. And so uh, with that, I'd like to also just mention uh, that uh, I consider Huda a rock star of uh, molecular uh, disease, and she won the 2017 Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences for her work that she'll be telling you about today and tomorrow. So welcome, Huda. It's great to see you here. Thank you so much, Judith for inviting me and for giving me the honor of giving the Steve Box lecture. It's really, he was an amazing man and to walk today through the war, what the wharf has built and look at the various research in initiatives here, it uh, speaks to the power of basic research and the stellar biochemical research in, in this institution. So I'm really honored to give this lecture and thank you for organizing such a fabulous program. Everybody I've met with, it's been very exciting. So um, to, today I'm gonna tell you a story, two stories actually, that are put together mostly to sort of inspire you to think about how neurodevelopmental disorders will come about 
and what does it really mean for the broader class of neuropsychiatric diseases? So this is uh, the way I prepared the stories today. Um, I would like to disclose some affiliations. Uh, the work I'll be presenting tomorrow will involve collaborations with UCB Pharmaceutical, given basic research we've done. They've taken that to develop uh, potential therapeutics, and um, that's relevant. Uh, some of the work I'll present today is in collaboration with Ionis Pharmaceutical. We do not receive any money from Ionis, but they do provide us the antisense oligos, and they also collaborate with my collaborator, Harry Orr, on Ataxin 1. And then I serve on an advisory board of Denali and the board of uh, directors of Regeneron. Um, so the first uh, story I'd like to tell you is the reason I am actually a scientist. It's about Rett syndrome. And I was inspired to work on Rett syndrome by actually the patients I saw, particularly Ashley was the first patient I saw with this disorder. And here she is at five years of age, about the time when I saw her in the clinic when I was still a neurology, uh, first year neurology resident. What's striking about Rett syndrome is that girls like Ashley are born healthy and then uh, go through a year to a year and a half of normal development, doing everything a typical girl would do, but gradually would lose all the skills they acquired. Their head growth will slow down, and they will uh, lose language communication, social communication, have balance problems, and uh, event seizures, and breathing, and many autonomic problems. Essentially, every part of the nervous system is affected. And when you see a child with this disorder, it doesn't leave you. And I happened to see Ashley. She was actually, uh, at the time, there were no cases diagnosed in the United States. There was only one report about uh, European cases. Um, and uh, seeing her leaves an impression on you. How devastating it is to really see someone healthy and then losing everything they've learned how to do. And it just happened serendipitously that I saw a child a week later with the same symptoms. So seeing two children with a disease no one has ever seen in my institutions or at that time in the United States, as far as we know, was really, uh, you know, left an impression on me and inspired me to look for more cases. And we found them in our clinic. And that's what inspired me to work on Rett syndrome. Uh, and really pursue the cause of it. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. This is a video to show you Rett syndrome in action. So you'll see this girl wringing her hands constantly. You're gonna see some rocking activity, some features that people typically see with people with autism. And you'll see here, is she trying to walk? She has difficulty initiating movement. So there's lots of problems with motor planning, instability, and Parkinsonian features. So the reason I wanted to figure out this disorder is because they were all girls, and I figured anything that looks so identical from girl to girl has to be genetic, and we need to find the gene for this disorder. The problem was, this was 1983 when I saw my first patient, and 1985 when I completed my clinical training and decided to join Art Baudet's lab to learn molecular biology. In 1985, you could not find the cause of a sporadic disease, and all red girls were typically like this, one in a family. So it, this, of course, raises doubt whether the disease is genetic, but more importantly, it was not possible with the technology available. And this is the reason I worked on the ataxias. That was the project that Art told me, you have to pick a project to, be, to learn molecular biology on. So I worked on the ataxia, while trying to figure out what to do about Rett, and you'll hear about that tomorrow. Fortunately, with uh, perseverance, uh, we found a gene in 1999, so 16 years after meeting Ashley, and we uh, discovered it to be a gene on the X chromosome, which explained why they are females, and it encodes methyl CPG binding protein 2. Um, at the time, the gene was not associated with any disease, but about nine years before we discovered it, Adrian Bird has found it as a protein that binds methylated cytosine, and as you see uh, in this cartoon. 
So that's what, what we knew about it at the time, and it still is. It's a protein that binds methylated cytosine. Uh, now we know not only CPGs, but also Cs followed by any nucleotide. So what I'd like to talk to you about today is tell you what we've learned since the discovery of the gene. What have we learned about the phenotypic spectrum of MACP2 mutations? And what What's, what are the effects of losing this protein on neurons? How can we treat this disorder? What therapeutic strategies do we have? And then what I have learned from studying this one rare disease, about one in 10,000 people, and how it is relevant to the broader neuropsychiatric disorders. So on the phenotype, I mentioned to you what classic Red syndrome uh, girls look like. And Basically, uh, these are typical symptoms, and we call that typical or classic RET. What we discovered, although all the, girl, all the people with RET were girls, we learned after the gene discovery that males who have a mutation, because this is on the X chromosome, they don't have the protection from the wild-type cells, and they are typically very severe. They have encephalopathy, they have motor problems, and sadly, when they have a mutation that totally inactivate the protein, they will die within one to two years of life. The, the reason the girls survive and do well, and the oldest one can live into their 70s and 80s, is that they're mosaic. This is on the X chromosome, so only one of their Xs carries the mutant allele, expresses the mutant allele, and the other X typically express the gene with a healthy allele. What we also learn, though, is that if a male has a milder mutation, or a female for this matter, but mostly males, if they have a milder mutation, which just partially inactivates the protein, then we see individuals that may present with totally different features, and most of these are psychiatric uh, features, autism, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, attention deficits, bipolar, and schizophrenia. Each is in a different color because the same patient will not have all these features. A patient may have just anxiety, hyperactivity, and uh, tremors, or one may have bipolar and uh, spasticity and so on. They all have mild, mild learning disability. So this is in the, this color because every one of them will have mild learning disability, but the psychiatric features are different. So why is this important? It's important because it tells us that the milder the mutation, the, the more you see phenotypes in the psychiatric spectrum, which tells you that these are probably the most vulnerable circuits where a mutation is so mild that you're not seeing as much motor deficit perhaps, but you're seeing psychiatric features. So this is in the humans and in mice, we could model this disease, and the mice have all the features of the disease. So here are the features of the disease, and when you mutate this gene in mice, you pretty much have almost all the features. Uh, and this led us to ask the question, what happens if we delete this from particular neurons in the nervous system? Would we get a subset of these features? Is there one particular neuronal type that's really critical? Because that will tell us maybe what neurotransmitter systems are most perturbed, and maybe we can do something about them. And here, I'm just going to summarize um, many decades of work and the work of uh, many postdocs uh, with a couple of examples. These are examples from uh, work by graduate student Chan Ling, graduate, at the time graduate student uh, Tuan, and two postdoctoral fellows that studied the effect of loss of this gene in either the excitatory neurons in the brain or the inhibitory neurons. Now, excitatory neurons make up about 80% of the brain, uh, brain cells and neurons, and inhibitory neurons, the other about 20%, and they come in different subtypes. So we studied the effect of loss of this gene in either type, and here's what we learned. What we learned is that if you take it out from excitatory neurons, you get anxiety-like behaviors, tremors, and obesity, problems with sensory motor gating, uh, motor coordination, and the animals will die prematurely. Those same problems occurred when you take it out from inhibitory neurons. So what this told us that this protein is essential for the function for neurons that control these behaviors. 
But what was interesting is that the inhibitory neuronal loss manifested all the other features of the syndrome, the repetitive behavior that you saw in the girls, the, uh, the hand wringing, which we see in the mice with forpo activity, the seizures, spasticity, the inability to perform motor functions properly, and social problems. All of these, we saw them with the inhibitory, but not the anxiety or the tremor. Those were excitatory. So what did we also learn from these studies? And I, again, I am summarizing because a lot of this published. What we learned from these studies is when you take this gene out of either inhibitory or excitatory neuron, you're partially disabling these neurons. You're not totally compromising your activity. You're decreasing their activity by perhaps 20 to 30 percent at most. So think about it. Partial inhibition of these neurons is causing, at least in males, all these features, including death. But it tells you that different neurons have different manifest different phenotypes based on the vulnerability. Eventually, I'm sure if we compromise them more, we're going to see so much more features because the network will be affected. Then we divided the inhibitory neurons in the various subtypes. And here again, we saw this modularity. We saw that with the somatostatin neurons, repetitive behavior and seizures, whereas the parvalbumin neurons, that when we saw the problems with social and motor and um, learning and memory. So this to us was, was surprising in that, one, we learned we're partially disabling neuron. Two, we've learned that there's modularity. And it tells you which seems you can begin to attribute partial dysfunction of a somatostatin neuron may make someone susceptible to seizure if it's a very mild dysfunction. Because think about this now, not only in the context of Rett syndrome, think about it in the context. This is what happens when you partially disable these type of neurons. So uh, to summarize what we've learned from these studies, we learned that moderate reduction in GABA and glutamate can cause several neuropsychiatric features in early lethality. And what this predicts that a much more subtle reduction, reduction in the realm perhaps of 10% rather than 20, 30% we saw in, when we took out uh, MACP2 out of these cells, might cause isolated autism or other psychiatric phenotypes. And from a therapy point of view, this told us, and we tested that, uh, again, I'm summarizing here, you can't really boost just one side of the system. You pretty much have to re regulate all uh, the activity of all cell types, and that means all the multiple neurotransmitters that are altered have to be, you know, you have to use a cocktail to treat the people. What we do now, we do give them uh, L-DOPA for the Parkinsonian feature, and we do give them sometimes um, serotonin reuptake inhibitors for the psych some of the anxiety features, but there is really no treatment that helps with all the symptoms. And this is what led us to explore uh, other mo approaches. Until we find better treatment, we decided perhaps we can explore circuit manipulation, and in particular, deep brain stimulation, which has been used in other disorders. The idea would be if we focus on one key phenotype, perhaps the learning and memory, and one anatomic region, the hippocampus, and manipulate the network activity, could that bypass um, the deficits we see from the dysfunction of these neurons? And for this, we collaborated with Jen Rong Tang, who's the director of the in vivo physiology core at our institute. And uh, Shuang Hao is the person, the postdoc, who's performed all that work in his group. So uh, the idea was is to use the same paradigm of deep brain stimulation that's used in human for Parkinsonism, but a different brain region. And in this area is the fornix, which has projections to the hippocampus. And so we st the stimulation is happening in uh, the diagonal band in the fornix, and the recording are in the dentate gyrus. So you ensure that you're doing proper stimulation, you're not inducing any abnormality seizures as such. And the paradigm were involved taking animals that are about two months of age and then treating them for a couple of weeks for one hour a day and then examining them about six weeks later to see have they benefited from that treatment. 
And we use the paradigms that are typically used in patients that are undergoing deep brain stimulation by neurosurgeons. And in this case, when we tested all the hippocampal learning and memory paradigms, we saw improvement. I'm showing you one example here where a mouse is put a cage and it hears a sound, it gets a foot shock and it will feel that foot shock. When it's brought back to the same cage, the hippocampal learning will show that this animal will freeze. It knows this context was bad, it where it got the sh uh, uh, shock. Also, if it hears the, hears the sound, it'll also freeze because that's amygdala mediated Q dependent. And in Rett syndrome, we know that the contextual fear is altered. So you see the wild type animals, they freeze uh, quite a bit, whereas the Rett animals will freeze much less. However, after deep brain stimulation, both will improve, but what's really nice is that the wild type animals now will become very similar to, I mean, the Rett animals after stimulation will become very similar to wild type animals. And we've done this for multiple behaviors for the hippocampus, and we see this effect. We also saw uh, that in the red mice, there is a decrease in neurogenesis. This is the dentate gyrus where neuro new neurons are born. And you'll see, I'll show you the quantitative data. There is reduction of that, and few of them incorporate in the network. But after deep brain stimulation, I hope you can appreciate that there is enhanced neurogenesis. And if you'd look at this here, again, the red mice have remarkably decreased neurogenesis compared to the wild type animal. But after the deep brain stimulation, that's improved and the number of neurons that actually incorporated in the network improved. So now that we know that this will work, there's, this opens up so many questions. What does this do to the network? What does the stimulation do? And this is why um, we, Lou, who was a postdoc at the time in the lab, uh, helped with uh, MSTP student Ryan Ash in Smirnakis lab, began to look at the CA1 neurons that are the beneficiary of this stimulation. And when we looked in slices using a calcium reporter, you can see here in these neurons that there is some activity. I, I hope you can see that. It's sparse activity. But when we look in the mutant mice, you'll see a lot more neurons firing together. Now, this is in animals that are early stage of the disease. They don't have seizures, so this is not due to seizure activity. It's just more neurons firing together. And if we are to quantify that, you'll see it here. Each of these lines is a neuron firing, and you'll see in the wild-type animal, it's random. In the null males, you'll see some neurons firing together, but in the females, we see a lot more neurons firing together. And this abnormal coincidence firing is, you don't want that at a baseline because we, we propose that that will interfere with learning and we're doing the follow-up study to show that uh, right now. And just because this is looking at imaging and slices, we recently confirmed that uh, Sarah Key, a graduate student in the lab working with Dion G, did tetrode recording. So she recorded from awake behaving animals and showed the same, that you see a lot more uh, coincidence in the firing in the rat mice. So what drives this? Um, here is the circuit. These are the CA1 neurons. And these neurons receive input from CA3 and they synapse on a group of inhibitory neurons uh, in this uh, Orion's layer. And the idea would be that these pyramidal cells that are excitatory will synapse on the inhibitory neurons, which then provide feedback inhibition. And it's that feedback inhibition that will keep cells from firing together. So I'm sharing all this detail with you because we looked at all the synapses in the hippocampus, and this was the one synapse where we found the abnormality. What we found that there's decreased excitatory input onto these inhibitory neurons as measured by frequency and amplitude. So now we have a synaptic phenotype that we know in this circuit is altered. And when we ask what does DBS do, and here's again, you see the increased synchrony, the deep brain stimulation restored the level of activity to normal after um, treatment in the mice. And then when we go back and now do the same analysis with the physiology, looking at uh, 
MACP2 positive and MACP2 negative cells in the female mice. We can now label them. You will see again there is decreased frequency and amplitude of this excitatory input in the uh, MACP2 null cells in female mice, but not in the wild type cells but this is normalized upon deep brain stimulation. So we have an idea how the deep brain stimulation is helping perhaps the learning and memory. We now know that at least one way it's helping is restoring um, the firing patterns and the synaptic connectivity. And uh, what we're doing now, we're proving that the, we're doing additional in vivo studies to prove that these Orion's layers neurons are really critical for capturing that learning and memory. Um, and mediating the deficits. Um, MACP2, as I mentioned to you, binds methylated cytosines. Exactly what it does after that is, is really hard because it's, it binds very broadly in the brain. It binds any methylated cytosine, essentially, it can. So there is no specific targets of this protein. When we lose it, we find a lot of gene expression changes. So we wanted to ask what happened to these gene expression changes after deep brain stimulation. So Amy Pohodish did the same experiments uh, as you've seen before in both uh, male and female mice and then harvested tissue to see what happens to gene expression after deep brain stimulation both in animals that have the protein and animals that completely lack the protein. And there are hundreds of genes that are misregulated in the MACP2 nodal dentate gy gyrus at baseline. And some of these are up, some of down. Majority of genes are actually down. Um, and there are also uh, different isoforms, splice isoforms uh, that are changed. What we discovered is that deep brain stimulation rescued the expression of about a quarter of these genes. And what's more interesting is that those 25% or so are uh, most critical for synaptic functions, synaptic connections. So that might explain to us why the DBS finally restored uh, the synaptic function and the synchrony. Perhaps some of these key genes and proteins are really critical for that function. And just to show you visually how this looks like, without any stimulation, the wild type and the knockout cluster separately because their gene expression patterns are different. However, after deep brain stimulation, both of them will go up remarkably compared to the baseline, but now they're intermingled. So the knockout brain uh, gene expression-wise is not easy to distinguish compared to the dentate gyrus compared to the wild type animal. So these are in the null animals. We were interested in the females because these are the model of Rett syndrome. So we repeated the same paradigm, and we collected um, the RNA at the same time when we did the behavior, and we knew that the animals have recovered. And when we see that, we see that many activity-dependent genes are equally activated in the uh, DBS uh, rat mice. But most importantly, you'll see that, again, while the females cl cluster differently uh, with uh, with a sham surgery after deep brain stimulation, many genes key for uh, synaptic plasticity and neuronal function are now normally upregulated, or at least to a similar level to the wild type, and we overcome the deficits. So this is at the molecular level what DBS has done. So in summary, uh, stimulation of the formnix improved hippocampal learning and memory. And I should mention uh, other investigators have used fornix stimulation in rats, and they showed it actually can enhance learning and memory. These are healthy, wild-type rats, and there have been studies to show it enhanced neurogenesis. And there have been studies in Alzheimer to see if it can improve in clinical trials in Alzheimer. As you can imagine, the Alzheimer brain is a little bit tricky because the, the neurons are, are probably, many of the neurons are gone, so one may not get the same benefit as one in a child where the whole system is intact. There is really no degeneration. There is just dysfunction. And uh, I've showed you that, I didn't show you the data, but uh, LTP was normalized in vivo LTP, and the patterns of synchrony were uh, normalized in neurogenesis and gene expression. So at least what we can say that the red brain, at least in mice, is responsive to neuromodulation.
Um, whether this is going to be true for humans, this is something we need to explore, and we're trying to figure out ways to explore that. But one thing that came out from these studies, we then looked at other uh, models of intellectual disability. And this is important because today there are several hundred genes that can cause intellectual disability. Many of them are much rarer than Rett syndrome. And this year marks the 20 year anniversary for the discovery of the Rett syndrome gene. And we still don't have a treatment. And there are many, dozens and dozens of labs working on Rett syndrome. So imagine how hard it is when a disease is common with a great animal model, with some knowledge about the protein. I, I cannot fathom how hard it's going to be for a disease where there may be five people affected with that disorder, much more rare proteins with very little knowledge about their function. So we were thinking that perhaps if deep brain stimulation can bypass the genetic defect, you can go straight to circuit manipulation and that may be helpful. And that's why we decided to look at uh, data where there's gene expression data on animals that have mutations that have been seen in the human to cause intellectual disability where there is an existing animal model and data on the dentate gyrus gene expression. And about a quarter of the genes altered in these animals are among the genes that are highly responsive to deep brain stimulation in both wild type animals and rat animals. Also for depression, a treatment with fluoxetine in animal models have been shown to, sh to cause increased neurogenesis. And given the uh, degree of neurogenesis we saw in our animal models, we compared the gene expression data from our DBS versus fluoxetine. And that's where we found the highest rate of overlap. And I should mention, in addition to the synaptic protein, there were many genes that were altered that promote neurogenesis or proneural survival. So after a new neuron is born, it's actually will survive and integrate in the circuit. So exercise also will do the same. And last but not least, people who've died from major depression and had genetic studies, gene expression studies on the dentate gyrus had many of the gene, or not many, about 17% of the genes that are altered and responsive to deep brain stimulation altered in these people. So I think it tells us that perhaps DBS has the potential and it, it does help in uh, boosting the level of many uh, genes who are important for synaptic function and pro uh, survival, but perhaps at the same time it can be helpful in more than one disorder. And of course, uh, one has to test that. Uh, we, what we also learn is that the brain lacking MACP2 can actually respond normally to gene expression upon this stimulation. So that's one way to bypass the deficit uh, in these uh, animals. And uh, we hope that it, it promises for improving hippocampal function for other disorders with intellectual disability. And to this end, uh, this is being tested now in other models of intellectual disability, and there is suggestion that it can help some of them. This is still ongoing work. For us, for Rett syndrome, we would also like to do before we contemplate clinical trials is look at other brain regions. Motor dysfunction is a major problem for Rett syndrome. So we're testing different areas of the brain to see if we can do the same paradigm, but now in different areas and correct some of the motor deficits. Because then one can envision implanting two stimulators, one for learning and memory, and one perhaps for motor function, and that's also ongoing work. Regarding the benefit from DBS in the mice, what we've shown that the benefit will last about three months, which is really amazing that a two-week treatment lasted about uh, three months. But after that, you'll have to repeat the treatment. So this is something we're also looking at. Uh, the hardest thing is going to be how to do such trials, because I think these girls have been with their disease and bypass critical period. So I don't think if we just stimulate, they're going to immediately learn. We're going to have to combine that with some type of behavioral therapy and training and physical therapy and so on to perhaps get them to do what we want, uh, what we hope they can accomplish. But this is one area we're currently uh, focusing on until additional therapies come into play. Uh, now, in addition to Rett syndrome, we learned something else uh, about this protein. We learned that uh, 
doubling it can also cause a disease. And this actually started in mice uh, where as part of a control experiment, we used a large insert genomic clone that contained the human gene with all its control elements and made transgenic mice. So these mice had twice the normal level of the protein. And to our surprise, they had uh, many problems. They had autism phenotypes, learning phenotypes, motor phenotypes, and um, stereotypies, epilepsy, and they died prematurely. A third of them died by one year of life. And it was having this mouse model that inspired us to look for patients who might have an extra copy of this gene. And we discovered, indeed, people with an extra copy of these genes exist. And other investigators, Vanesh was the first one to describe on a series of those uh, people where people had large duplications uh, in XQ28 that had the same features that we have seen in the mice. It was really, the similarity was pretty striking. Now, the human patients had large duplications. They could be 500 kilobases, so they spanned more than the, just the MECP2 gene. But the minimal e region of overlap included MECP2 and a gene, a kinase, IRAC1, which is, uh, plays a role in uh, the immune system. However, I think given that our mouse only had the MACP2 gene and reproduces all the features of the disease, we feel comfortable that the majority of the features of the disease are probably just driven by MACP2. So in the case of MACP2, I, I'm not going to tell you too much about the neurobiology. All I'll tell you, it's the opposite of the loss of function. So when genes that go down in the loss will go up in the duplication and vice versa and the physiological properties are the opposite. But what I'm going to share with you is the strategy we're doing to treat this disease. And what uh, Hezi Stamberg, uh, who was at the time a postdoc in the lab, and now Yin Yao Shao is completing, <coughs> uh, continuing this work, used two strategies to address this question. One genetic, whereby we take one of the genes genetically and ask if we do this in adult mice, would we correct all the features? and the other one using antisense oligonucleotide. So I'll tell you, if you do this in adult animals genetically, you rescue all the features. So how about antisense oligonucleotides? Ionis designed antisense oligonucleotides against the human gene. So this way we take it out, leaving just the human gene intact. And this just to show you how these are wild-type animals. These are the duplication, and here's the ones treated with the ASO. You pretty much normalize the levels, and you can see that by fluorescence. Just showing you a couple of behaviors. These animals have severe anxiety. They don't uh, venture into open areas, and after the ASO treatment, they improve. They have many seizures. They pretty much, we, we did a treatment at, in seven month old animals after they've had the disease now for about, they were symptomatic for about five months and they were having continuous seizures all the time based on EEG monitoring and video. And you'll see with the antisense oligo treatment, they improved. So this gave us hope that this could be used as a treatment because many of you know antisense oligonucleotide can be used in infants and children and have been proven effective and safe in spinal muscular atrophy. But we have one challenge in that here we only knocked down the human gene and we left intact the mouse gene, which was a safe thing to do. We, we went from 2x to 1x, but we were guaranteed there's 1x left. But in the human condition, there are two human alleles. So you really have to be sure you're able to titrate the dose so that you're not overshooting. Because if we go too low, we're going to give them Rett syndrome or encephalopathy. And we created a new mouse model with two humanized alleles and uh, showed that these mice have uh, twice the level of normal. And then we were able to show you can actually titrate the dose of the ASO to where if you use just the right dose, you can bring it back where it's very similar to wild type. Of course, with much higher dose, you'll go too low. But the point is one can titrate the antisense oligos just as you would titrate a blood hypertension drug, for example. And here's an example where you see healthy mice. The duplication mice, they freeze more in this contextual fear um, assay. And then 
if we give them the 250 microgram that doesn't quite correct, they don't correct as much, but if you give the 500 uh, microgram, then they are similar to wild type animals. And this is another behavioral assay where these animals spend uh, much longer time on this rotating rod, a behavior we don't quite understand why they do that, but they are different from the wild type animals. In this case, both dosages, the 250 and the 500, corrects this phenotype back to wild type level. So we feel pretty comfortable that antisense oligos can be used and titrated to lower uh, the level of this protein. We're still working with IONIS to really ensure safety because that's still very important and trying to figure out ways where perhaps we can measure markers that will tell us how much we're driving the protein down. And that's uh, work we're spending a lot of energy on now before we move into clinical trials and through drug development. So if I wanna summarize, one thing we've learned from all of these studies is how sensitive the brain is to MACP2 levels. So on this curve, you'll see if one totally lacks the protein, as in human males totally lacking this gene, it's quite fatal. Of course, Rett syndrome is right here. They're mosaic, 50% of the cells um, having uh, the wild type allele will cause Rett syndrome. We know from animal studies, if you reduce the protein level by 50%, you get a moderate phenotype. And I shared with you people who have milder mutations where they have psychiatric features, and this is one example of such mild mutation. The LNN140V doesn't cause any disease in females, but in males it causes either juvenile onset schizophrenia or bipolar. And this is the right level. If you have twice the normal level, we get this severe progressive neurological disease in males. Uh, the females are protected because of X inactivation. Most of these mothers we find, they have only the wild type X chromosome being expressed, the cells with the wild type X being expressed. And we have animal models with the triplication that are also more severe, and we know humans with the triplication die much earlier in life than some of the individuals with the duplication who might suffer uh, premature death in their 20s or 30s. So this is a protein that's truly graded, and we've now learned from animal studies that 10% difference in the level of this protein can affect phenotype, whether it's brain weight or some other features. So uh, it's really important to think about that in the context of human disease, because I am sure there are mutations somewhere here where you have maybe five to 10% increase or decrease that will present with something totally milder than intellectual disability and juvenile schizophrenia, as we see here. And I think those remain to be discovered. So having learned all this and having learned how to value protein levels from studying this protein, led us to explore studied in another protein. Um, and this one is a synaptic protein, uh, SH3 and multiple anchoring repeat domain protein 3, or SHANK3 for short. This is a protein that's at the synapse. So this, these are dendrites of excitatory neurons here, and you'll see a dendritic spine and this protein is present in these spines, and it connects proteins that uh, regulate the actin cytoskeleton with a surface protein and receptors. And what we know is that it's, it has two other paralogs, shank one and shank two. They're broadly expressed, but sometimes there are some regions of the brain that have one and not the other. So this one is abundant in the striatum, and it's also expressed in the hippocampus. Uh, many other investigators have studied the loss of function of this protein, and we know loss of one copy can cause a, a syndrome called Phelan McDermott syndrome, characterized by some facial features as well as intellectual disabilities and autism. And there are rare cases of schizophrenia. And this is a common disorder, accounting to about 1% of all ASD and IDD cases. Maybe a little bit less common than RET, but fairly uh, common. What we became interested in is whether, just like MACP2, it's also dosage sensitive, and whether the gain of this protein is consequential. 
And part of the reason we were interested in that is because there were two or three reported cases of individuals that have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, restlessness, unstable temper, and schizophrenia. And those people had very big duplications that uh, contain many genes, but Chang 3 was one of those genes. So those were reported, two or three cases, and we were interested to know, among all these genes, could Chang 3 be the mediator? And to do this, uh, we generated uh, a mouse with an extra copy of this gene, whereby, again, we put it under its own control and elements, and asked if having 50%, this is on the autosome, so they have two normal copies and now we've added one more, if adding one extra allele will cause a phenotype. And this was work done by Kihun Han and then uh, some of the human work and the physiology was collaboration with Jimmy Holder, Christian, and Wei Lu. And this is one of those phenotypes that you actually do not need to even do more analyses to see. I'm going to play the video and you can appreciate how obvious it is. I think if you just stare for 30 seconds, you'll realize quickly which mouse has the extra copy. And so it's the mouse that's constantly on the go and just will not hold still. And you'll see that in these animals in their home cages, uh, and it goes on and on. But of course, we need to quantify that, and you'll see here quantifying the activity, both in males and females, you'll see they're quite active. We assumed immediately this is attention deficit hyperactivity-like model, and usually when you suspect that, you have to give them amphetamines to see if that's really the correct diagnosis. And when we gave them amphetamine, they only got more active. So their activity tripled and was really bad. So we knew it's not hyperactivity. And if it's not hyperactivity, then the one thing that keeps you on the go all the time, it's mania-like behavior. Now, proving to anyone that a mouse has mania-like behavior is very difficult. So this is where we turned back and we asked if we could possibly find humans with duplications of this gene and nothing else. And that's where we collaborated with, uh, as I mentioned, Christian and uh, our genetic laboratory and discovered uh, some patients, in this particular case, this one example, an individual who had a duplication uh, an extra copy of this gene that only contains this gene and one other gene, but this other gene is only expressed in sperm and is not expressed in brain. So that gave us confidence that it's probably just the shank three extra doses in the brain that may be responsible for his diagnosis of bipolar, mood swing, anger issues, and attempted suicide. And uh, one thing we noticed are the seizures. We had not looked for seizures in our animals, so we decided to go back and look at seizures. And lo and behold, we find that our duplication mice also had both EEG abnormalities compared to the wild type and seizure activities. And we uh, pinpointed increased number of excitatory um, dendritic spines as uh, potentially driving that. We've done a lot of uh, studies on that. What was really important is when we try to treat these animals with lithium, as typically one uses in bipolar, they did not respond to the lithium, but they did respond to valpu valproate, and that rescue the mania-like behavior, the seizures, and all. They, uh, there are many other behaviors they had besides the hyperactivity. I'm not showing you all that, but they were all consistent with mania-like behavior, such as being active, not sleeping as much, and so on. So I think the reason I share this story, because knowing the underlying genetic cause of the disease can sometimes guide the choice of the therapy. One of the people we identified with the duplication, she was a child, and children, they're manic. Sometimes they can get the diagnosis of attention deficit hyperactivity, and she was put on uh, amphetamines, but she did not respond to that. So that really nailing the correct diagnosis will, he will help with the management. So if we were to summarize what we've learned about the Shank 3 story, we know you have to have, again, the right amount of the protein, haploin sufficiency causing uh, intellectual disability, 
and uh, the syndrome and schizophrenia, whereas this duplication causes mania-like behavior or bipolar. And um, the last thing I want to share with you is this one story about one missense mutation that was found in a child in autism that we decided to study in great depth that gave us really good insight about um, how certain proteins function in the brain. So this mutation is, uh, happened at the serine 685. It's a serine to isoleucine mutation in Shank 3 this was an autism sequencing consortium that reported on this gene, and they said it was in one person with autism. That's all we knew about this one person. So the problem is when you see that, you cannot really conclude it's causing the disease because it's just one individual, and it's a missense mutation. We became interested in it because when we looked in vivo at the phosphorylation site in Shank 3, we identified many of them, and one of them was at the same serine. So we thought this would be really interesting to study. And we also knew that this region is a region of interaction between Shank 3 and ABEL interacting protein 1. So an ABEL if you, if you recall my schematic, I said Shank 3 connect the actin cytoskeleton protein, and able interacting protein 1 is one of those proteins that's critical for um, actin nucleation, and I'll get back to that. So we decided this is worth studying to see if this mutation really disrupting any function and has any consequences in vivo. So Li Wang, a graduate student in the lab, created a knock-in mouse for making this substitution for the single amino acid in Shank 3. And the first thing he looked at is in vivo using brain tissue, the interaction between ABI1 and Shank 3. And you can, I hope, appreciate here that IPing ABI1 we bring down a lot less Shank 3 in the knock-in animals compared to YTAP animals. Now, Shank 3 has many, many interactors, and we tested many of them. And it was really only this one interaction that was affected. All the other interactions we looked at were normal. So now we have a protein, um, a, a mutation that only affects one protein interaction. And we can ask, what is the phenotype of these mice? And we compare that phenotype to mice that completely like the protein. So mice that completely like the protein have many, many abnormalities, including learning and memory problems and other problems. Mice with this knock-in allele, on the other hand, they had very specific phenotypes. They all have to do with social behavior. So if you look at these videos, you'll notice that when we bring an intruder into the cage, the uh, wild-type mouse leaves the intruder alone check them every now and then, but leaves them alone. But if you look at the bottom cage where the knock-in mouse is, you'll notice there's constant grooming, constantly chasing the intruder and excessively grooming them. And this goes on and on and on. They just don't leave them alone. And you can quantify that as shown here. Another uh, test revealed increased social dominance. If you put two mice in this tube, Half of the time, this mouse will back up. This Half of the time, this mouse will back up. This is what happens in typically wild-type animals, or at least they will back up some of the times. And rarely one wins. In the wild-type, maybe 20% wins. But in these animals, they're constantly winning. They just don't know to back up. They're constantly sitting there until the other animal will back up. And last but not least, there was decreased vocalization in these knock-in animals. Now, we didn't only look at these things. We looked at all the other phenotype in the knockout mice of Shank 3, and none of them were present in this animal. So this told us this loss of this one interaction is really causing a very specific phenotype. And we looked here at uh, synaptic transmission and spine abnormality, and we found there's some decrease in the excitatory postsynaptic current frequency and amplitude in the striatal neurons. These are the ones that only express shank 3 and none of the other shank paralogs. And we saw some reduced dendritic spine density in these neurons. So now we're going to go back and ask what's happening at a uh, protein level. So I mentioned to you shank 3 is in the spines and normally is at this postsynaptic density, and it can interact with ABI1. So um, 
what other things happen. To do this, we looked at the proteome, the interactor of ABI1, and we have done ourselves two types of screens to find the interactors of Shank3. We've done yeast to hybrid, as well as IP mass spec from uh, postsynaptic density purifications from uh, the brain tissue. And uh, we identified many actin-related protein complex proteins and actin, but the one group of proteins that were shared between the two is the wave complex, which is important between ABI1 and Shank3, that was the wave complex, which is important, as I mentioned, for actin nucleation. So we asked if this mutant allele can interact with wave, and we found it did not, it could not interact with wave when you have this. So this suggested to us that ABI1 that interacts with wave is probably the reason Shank3 also interacts with wave. So in the absence of ABI1 interaction, we're losing this. And with this, we wanted to see if disrupting the interaction between Shank3 and ABI1 uh, reduced the level of the wave uh, protein at the postsynaptic density. And when we measure it in total brain extract, we don't see much difference. But when we measure it at the postsynaptic density where the action is, that's where we see the difference in both the levels of ABI1 as well as the level of wave because they're not being brought uh, through this interaction. So what this told us is this one interaction uh, when disrupted, can cause very specific phenotypes. In human, it was one case of autism, but now we know in the mouse that this is really what's mediating the phenotype in the human, and then, uh, it revealed to us the mechanism by which this loss of interaction is causing probably these other abnormalities. So if you look at Shank 3, it's starting to look very similar to MACP2, where you have to have the level just right. Haploinsufficiency, which is a null allele, causes syndromic uh, autism with other features, whereas this minor allele causes autism only, and having a duplication causes uh, bipolar. So pulling it this together, I've now really learned to respect that alterations in the levels of proteins that affect synaptic function can cause neuropsychiatric phenotype, and there is a gradation based on the degree of loss of that function. And we think that some rare variant might compromise just one aspect of a protein function, causing a partial phenotype. And we think this is likely to cause some of the more common uh, psychiatric uh, features. So remember, this one missense mutation, as mild as it might seem, it still caused a severe phenotype because this was a child that presented with autism. So this person presented early on in life with features. When you think about a psychiatric disorder such as schizophrenia where the person may go through childhood very well and only present when they're 20 years of age, it's gonna probably be even a milder mutation. I think this is the challenge facing psychiatry today. How are we gonna find those genes where a very small subtle perturbation may be causing disease? And I hope I convinced you today that rigorous evaluation of good mouse models can inform clinical medicine. So. In the case of MACP2 duplication, it predicted the human disorders. In the case of Shank3 duplication, it showed us the mania that uh, then allows us to discover the patients. And this uh, missense mutation corroborated uh, the pathogenicity of a mutation. And I think what's really important is going back and forth between the human and animal models. Uh, we're always inspired by the patients but one has to study them in, in animal models and look for phenotypes that uh, are true to the disorder, that are meaningful. And eventually, uh, as in the case, you know, with the people with bipolar and seizures, it was the patient that let us to go back and look for seizures in our animal models. So this back and forth is really important. Uh, and I find it, it's the only way really if we're gonna make a difference uh, for either discovering mechanism of pathogenesis or eventually come up with uh, some precision medicine. And as I showed you in the case of Shank 3 overdosage, there are some situations where you can actually change the management based on understanding the genetics. So with that, I'd like to thank all the people who've contributed to the work. I always like to thank Ruthie, the postdoc in my lab, who've discovered the Rett syndrome gene after three years of sequencing gene after gene to no avail. Uh, 
she finally found it, and then I, measured, I mentioned all the other contributors to the work and our collaborators. And special thanks to the families, Red Syndrome, MACP2 Disorders, and Shank Duplication families, and of course, our funders. Thank you very much. So let me just say that I'm sure that Huda will be taking questions, but afterwards there's going to be a reception over in, in biochemistry, so you're all welcome to join us to talk to her in more depth over there. So we'll take some questions now. After. Yes. Uh, Sorry, I, <laughs> I skipped details to, to cover more grounds. Um, the way we delivered it, the first time we delivered it in the published paper using pumps, where we, we put uh, LZ pumps in. The oh, the question, sorry. How did we deliver the ASOs? Uh, so in the published paper, we used pumps. Uh, so it was delivered over a period of six weeks. But in the new work, we just used intraventricular injections. And this sort of mimics what would be done in a human down the line, which is a spinal tap intrathecal uh, introduction. And what's surprising, again, I didn't show all the data here, but it does have a broad distribution. So it reaches different regions of the brain, and the degree of reduction of MACP2 is similar throughout the brain. Maybe the cerebellum a little bit less, but other than that, it's pretty similar. Many, yes. And so is, is this just one example, and do they cause autism and schizophrenia yes. as well? Yes. Well, schizophrenia, we, we don't have as many genes for schizophrenia, but there are uh, many genes that affect chromatin uh, from enzymes that affect histone modifications to other chromatin remodelers that have been discovered as causes of autism. In fact, it, it's among the more common categories of uh, genes that cause autism and intellectual disabilities. And, and are these expressed in the brain? Are they enriched in the brain, or are they expressed everywhere, or are you? Mm -hmm. So the question is whether uh, brain unique expression is what's driving the phenotype, and the answer is no. These are broadly expressed proteins. MACP2 is expressed in the peripheral nervous system, is expressed in the peripheral tissues, in many other tissues, but we do know that the phenotype comes from its loss in the nervous system, because if you only do a knockout, I mean, I shared with you the inhibitory and excitatory neurons, that's enough to reproduce most of the features of the disease, but even if you do it in the whole brain, you get similar features. So although they're expressed in the peripheral tissues, the phenotypes are brain phenotypes. So the question is, are there changes in the levels of mitochondria? They, we have not been able to see much changes in the mitochondrial function and or um, if you, we didn't really measure levels, but at least from a functional point of view, there haven't been many changes in the animal models that we've been able to show. Uh, in the past, people have looked in humans, and for some time, people suspected there could be mitochondrial dysfunction. The data are mixed. There may be some changes, but there's so much disuse and decreased activity, it's hard to tell what's really primary and secondary. I don't think of MACP2 as a mitochondrial disorders because uh, most people have not really been able to pinpoint any mitochondrial specific deficits. So the, the question is, would deep brain stimulation, at least in the hippocampus, in the, for, in the fornix to help the hippocampus, would that help 
any disorder where it could be synaptic dysfunction. And this is what's being tested right now at our center. Um, uh, Jean Rang has looked at CDKL5 uh, disorder where they have learning and memory. And he's also looking at additional disorders. The challenge is many of these human diseases are not as well modeled in the mice. So when you go back to test for behavior, we can't either replicate what's been published or we don't see much of a phenotype. But I think the data are hinting that it can help other disorders. And until you know, he tests this in two or three models, we will know. So it's possible that if you have decreased synaptic plasticity and some decreased function in uh, learning and memory that's associated with decreased synaptic plasticity, we do know that this treatment is enhancing synaptic plasticity and neurogenesis. So a disorder that may benefit from those will probably benefit. And the examples I showed, uh, will be probably some diseases that could benefit because we know that genes that are altered in these examples are corrected with DBS. It's not just the, uh, the phenotype of the function, but anatomically, you stimulate it. So it makes more uh, synapses. Um, so what we know anatomically, it makes more new neurons. We have not really measured synapses. We just measured the physiology, the plasticity, and we saw that that's normalized. But we have not looked at synapses per se in the animal models. Right, and this is, we're, we're trying to find the optimal way to, re to repeat that because sometimes as if you do this and then you come back to the same animals, it's hard to do some of the same testing on them. You sometimes lose the actual phenotype. So this is what we're optimizing right now to do that. I'd like to know if you can do it for two to three, you know, two years at least through the lifespan of the mouse and what happens, yeah. Right. So this is really the big challenge and conundrum in, in, at the molecular level. And part of the reason I didn't dwell over our molecular study of microbe 2 because I still think it's work in progress. Um, it is surprising that there are more genes that are downregulated than upregulated. And what you see, let's say there are about, we, we find that in some tissues we see about 1,500 genes that are downregulated. The same genes will be upregulated in the gain of function model, the duplication model. So the question is, why is that? How much of that primary? How much is that secondary? And as much as we've tried to really to get at that point, it's been very hard. So we're going now to many additional biochemical studies to find you know, more interactors, what could be modifying this protein, and to really do some time studies to really identify the earliest possible changes to really um, explore what's primary and secondary. But you're absolutely right. If you just look at the gene expression patterns, it does not look like a classic repressor, and we don't quite know why is that. So it, it could be that in different contexts, it does different things. It could be it represses very few genes and all the other things are secondary. It could be that it represses some and activates some, and we're exploring all these possibilities. So I think we should thank Kudu one more time. Thank you.